Many men have risen thinking that they have got something other that's very important. We have had movements like the Seventh-day Adventists, even Pentecostal Adventists. As I say these things, as this message would eventually find its way among Jewish friends over there, I beg the Jewish listener, please, I realize I am a Gentile, but I do not preach this message trying to belittle, put down, or to, we will say, to nullify anything about the law. But I do want the Jewish believer to know I am not speaking to find favor with anybody. I leave it in the hand of God. Years ago, when I first started preaching, I never thought one day that I would be responsible for a publication to go to the ends of the earth. And I want the Jews that will listen to this tape. The little publication we call The Contender goes to practically every free nation on the face of the earth. And back in the early 90s, it went into Russia. Outside of China, I don't know of another place that it doesn't receive it. Yet it's, it's going right at the, at, the, at the doorway. It goes into Hong Kong and Singapore. So I leave that up to God. Now, <clears throat> since there has been so many things through the years of time, negative, and things said about the law and about grace. It is true many Jews have a very misunderstanding about Gentiles and why they treat the law like they do. Up to a point, many Jews may feel justified in saying things about the Gentiles like they do. But nevertheless, let it be known, as I speak this message, I trust that God will give me the right words in the right way, in the right spirit of humility to set the mind of the Jewish person and the listener at ease. I'm not preaching this message to tear down the law. Quite the opposite. But I am preaching this message to let you know there is a difference between what the law was and what grace is. It is true, the law came by Moses, as you see. You'll find that in the writings of John. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's also in the writings of John. And remember to my Jew uh, Jewish friends and listeners, don't forget, the first people that was on God's green earth that ever believed what Jesus said was Jews. Don't never forget that. And we Gentiles, though we are the descendants of many generations down through time, it is true, we are the descendants of, I will say this, I've always said Gentiles are crazy people. One will say one thing and another will say something else. You never know which one, which way they're either going. But at the same time I say that, I'm not ignorant to the fact of what God has done among the Gentiles down to these 2,000 years of time. We Gentiles look back in history and time. We thank God for sending among us our ancestors. Men who were Jews by race. But they were men of God, Christian believers. And may I say this. What's the difference between a Christian Gentile and an unbelieving Gentile? Well, as far as he knows, there's nothing different. As far as the color of his hair, there's nothing different. Well, then what is it? Don't forget, in the book of Acts it says they were first called Christians at Antioch. That's in Syria. 
And who were those first Christians in Antioch? It wasn't the Gentile Syrians. It was Jews in the dispersion that was settled there. Because I remind you, the man they call Saul, who later his name was changed to Paul, who became the Gentile apostle to us Christians, us Gentile nations. Before he was ever converted, he was on the road to Damascus. He was part of the Sanhedrin. He had a very angry attitude about Jews at, Damas at Antioch, even being influenced by this new faith. He had already consented to the death of many of them. But he was there, he was going there to, to get many of them, have them arrested and brought back to Jerusalem probably to stand trial and then be martyred. This was the attitude of the, the man that was called Paul later in his original state. And I'm mindful of what Paul's later in years of his writing says. As of touching the law of Moses, blameless. He did his best to keep it to the letter. But it was this man by the name of Paul that God gave him a revelation that far exceeded any other revelation that any of the other Jewish apostles had that brought the message of Christ to the Gentiles. On the road to Damascus, when he was knocked down, I don't think he was walking, I think he was riding a horse. He was about knocked over the horse. He saw a great light. When the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him, and later then he went on into the city. And there was a man there by the name of Ananias who had been converted already. He was praying later when Paul was all now in the city. And the Lord told him to go out into the way called straight and go down to a certain house. You'll find a man there. By the name of Saul, he is originally from Tarsus. That's over in southern uh, Turkey. You tell him these words. That he's been chosen to be a light to the Gentile world. And a means of salvation to the ends of the earth. I remind every Jew to listen to that. I'm not ignorant throughout the New Testament what he taught. And there was never a Jew in that hour that ever dared to contest him, but what sooner or later they didn't wind up in trouble. He was one Jew that could look upon a Gentile and thank God for his grace that had been bestowed in his life. I do not deny the fact that he was a Jew, but I will say this. If this man's teaching that far back was to be a means of salvation to the ends of the earth, that means an end of time. And I remind the Jewish listener, I am a Gentile, yes. And I am fully aware of what history has said, what men have done. They've twisted, they've construed, they have deluded, they've done this and that. But I have to say, this truth of this New Testament gospel has been restored. And I'm a witness of it. I don't say that I've ever been right at everything that I ever thought in life. But I'm thankful to the grace of God that he's allowed me to see things in his precious word that stops me short and makes me to realize it's grace that he's done this. So now then, we get at the basis then of our subject. Law versus grace. You find that in the writings of St. John's Gospel. I don't ask you to necessarily turn to it. But that's just where I got my text. <clears throat> I receive word once in a while from some of the Messianic Jews. We believe in keeping the law as well as the things that we believe about the Messiah. Baptized in his name, he's the son of God, God was in him, so on and so forth. I want my Jewish listeners to fully understand. <clears throat> I know what the Torah has in it. But I know also what Paul taught. There's quite a difference between grace and law. 
So if the Jewish listener will just listen, allow me as a Gentile to express to you what God has done for us. I don't think your law will make you a bit better in how you live than what grace has done for me. And I'm not ignorant of what the Torah says. So tonight, I ask you to turn with me to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Because I had a man from over there to write me these things. We are finding this in Matthew, the fifth chapter, starting in the 17th verse. Jesus has been speaking how that your light set on a hill and so on and so forth. Now all of a sudden he changes the thought. He says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. Now that right there is, is a nutshell full. If he didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill, then what does fulfill mean? It literally means to make known, to make applicable everything the law has contained and spoke of as a promise. We're not going to draw the whole picture in this one service, no. This is going to cover several probably services. But we're going to give the law a good chance to speak for itself, along with grace to speak for itself. John said, as he records, the law was given by Moses, and that's true. Exodus, the 19th chapter. But it was a John, it was John who was a Jew also. He said the other thing, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Well, what's the difference between what Moses said and what Jesus said? Well, was it not Moses who said that a prophet like unto me, will the Lord from among your brethren rise up unto you, and him shall you hear? Amen. Well, who was he talking about? He was talking about the Messiah. And the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, and the Selots, and all of them in that hour, when he was walking on earth, came to fulfill what the prophets had spoke would be. They treated him like he was a devil. It's true, there's things he said that looks like he was contrary to the law, but he was bringing out the spiritual application of what the law really was pointing to. The law says, thou shalt not. The Lord said, don't do this. The law said, don't do that. And as long as you didn't do those things and did this and did that, that's all the law required. Along with keeping certain festivity days and all the other traditions that the law had with it. But we're not pointing the finger at the law. But we're trying to bring out the real meaning of what the law was pointing to and what it was not pointing to. So let's go on. So if he was going to fulfill it, let's see he began to make a sermon here. For verily I said to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So here we see the word fulfilled, fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments. And this, what Jesus said, is true. And shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But if it's going to be taught, we've got to understand what part of it is that we're going to teach. For I say unto you that except your righteousness exceed 
the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, now we're coming down a, a new world road. Accept your righteousness. From the time Moses gave the law until the time that Christ had come on the scene, we're working in the proximity of some 1,400 years of time. They have had the law. When Moses gave it to them at the mount of, foot of Mount Sinai, Moses was on top, but they were at the foot of Mount Sinai. What a phenomenon they, they saw. But when Moses came from there, here was the law written on tables of stone. They were to take that and make little emblems of it with the writings and hang it over the doorpost. Every morning when they went in or out, thou shalt not, thou shalt do this, and thou shalt do that, and so on and so forth. He reminded them. But we're going to find out when we're done with this message. God in our day has taken it off of the doorpost of your home and put it in your heart. Amen. Now that's quite a difference. Let's go ahead, because as we notice here, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, well that's what the law said, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I said to you, that whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, the law never said a thing about this. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Really, what has Jesus done then? He has said about the Pharisee, yeah, as long as the law said, thou shalt not kill, and you hadn't killed actually physically, you felt justified. I've kept the law. But you walk around within society. Uh, here's John. Here's Jim. Here's Jack. You hate the ground they walk on. You'd like to bash your brains out. But the law keeps you from doing it. But when Christ came, hallelujah, he did something for you. Wherein you like to hate, you would like to bash your brains out. But now then, he's taken off of the doorpost of your home and he puts it in the heart. Hallelujah. Amen. Now you're living under the new covenant. No matter what they say about you. No matter how much they want to belittle you. You say, have mercy upon them, on the Lord. What I think of Stephen, yes, a Jew, in the book of Acts. Before he was converted to this faith, he was just like all the rest of the Jews. He probably had his likes and dislikes, his don'ts and do's. But when his faith was changed, he was a complete new man, made over by the grace of God. And when that bunch of Pharisees see him preaching in the streets, saying the things he did, oh, it made them so angry. They began to gnash on him with t stones and stuff. And that was, they was bashing his brains out. He wasn't laying there on the ground. I hate you, Henri bastards. Directly his face lit up with a smile. And said, I see Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. Father, forgive them for they know what, what know not what they do. That's quite a difference. The law couldn't put that in a man. All the law could do, don't do it. But grace did something else. Grace took you a step further than what the law could do. Amen. You can go ahead and read down through the rest of this chapter here. 
Jesus touches many aspects of the law, in the social, in the spiritual, and in the natural aspect. To show you, brothers and sisters, the law touched the natural man that we are born into this world of. But the Jewish people was the only race that had ever received a law from God that was worded like this. It was made for the sinner man that we all are. It didn't really, really make them righteous. Yet nevertheless, it is true, God up to a certain point imputed righteousness to the man or woman that walked in obedience to that law. Because God plainly told them when he gave them that law. He said he has chosen them to be a particular race of people, among the people, a light to exemplify his goodness and mercy. <clears throat> but then I'm also mindful, mindful of the fact after John the Baptist came to testify of the one to come, who was Jesus, and he introduced him one day as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. John's in prison. Some of his faithful disciples still hanging around, hoping that something would take, John would get loose. But one day John sent them, you go ask that man, are you the one we look to? Look for or do we look for another one? You can read in the New Testament what Jesus said when they came. And after they were gone, Jesus began to lift up John for the faithful stand that he had took. But then Jesus also said these words, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached. And every man presses into it means you've got to put forth an effort. This old flesh that we live in, it's bound by tradition. It can be bound by sin, alcohol, any other thing. The things the law said not do, you can't keep from doing it. I'm going to come into the scriptures that Brother Allen was preaching on last Thursday night. But brothers and sisters, we've got to understand Paul had to contend with it. There was others in the day of Paul that had to run into these characters. They want to mix a little law with a little grace because they were hoping they could find prestige among both sides of the road. When you start doing that, you're not upholding anything. You're compromising. There's a lot of things we Gentiles have been condemned for. Because brothers and sisters, they've been misunderstood. Because if you don't have a revelation, really what the law was pointing to, you don't even know how to touch us Gentiles. You just think you do. I'm thankful that I'm privileged to be able to speak some things, hoping that I can say some things that some precious Jews that have went through a lot of persecution, ridiculement, Living in areas of hostility, never knowing what the night was going to bring. I hope that I can say something other to let them know. That we're living in the closing era of time. And that both the Jew and the Gentile, and I don't speak to the unbelieving element on either side. I speak to the believing element on both categories. Conditions in front of us. And time itself is going to necessitate that our understanding of each other is going to be brought closer and closer together as the grace of God makes it possible. Because if God promised in the last days, he would not only bring Judah and Benjamin back, but he would also bring the ten tribes back, which is called Samaria. And he would blend them together. That there would no longer be enmity but either, between either group, as it was in the Old Testament period. But I say this, after 1900 and some years of grace among us Gentiles, it came to us in the truth that Apostle Paul taught. And it's been restored as the Apostle Paul taught it. We're not, we're not asking anybody to go out of the way to listen to us. But we're making it available. 
I realized this many times. Precious Jews would say, well, we'd like to translate the New Testament and get it back into the Jewishness of it. Well, I have to say, and I'd have to question that kind of an outlook. Who do you think these, this New Testament was written to in the first place? It was, written to, it was written to Gentile churches. Yes, they had certain Jews within it. And many times it was the Jews in the local dispersed area that was the first candidates to become part. But around that nucleus was brought an element of Gentile people. That composed and made up that local Gentile church. But the different epistles was not written to the Jewish person in that group. It was written to the whole, uh, whole group. And that's why, brothers and sisters, when we come to the last book in the Bible, written in 96 AD, last book's ever been recorded in the New Testament. It was a Jew on the Isle of Patmos in exile. The Romans was hoping to shut his mouth, but it didn't. Because brothers and sisters, you can put a man in a hole in the ground, you can put him on the top of a mountain, you can put him in the cave. But God knows where he's at. And if God comes down by his power and spirit and reveals to him something, how can you shut him up? Sooner or later, God will get that word out of there. And that's exactly what John did. And the book of Revelation is not a letter written necessarily to the Jewish nation because it was in dispersion. It was written to the churches, the seven churches of Asia Minor. They set types of what Christianity was going to go through through the centuries of time. I don't justify some of the things that's been done. But then I ask my Jewish listener, please, please, let's be sensible. All I have to do is read the gospel, what Jesus had to contend with in his hour. And look what the Jewish nation had done to the law and the statutes and the ordinances and all the other festivities. They had traditionalized, and some of them didn't even believe in nothing. That's just like Gentiles today. They don't want to believe in nothing. And when we think of the Jews today, they, they call them the, the leftists. Well, brothers and sisters, not only is there leftist Jews, there's leftist Gentiles. There's liberal as a, the devil himself. But if we're going to look at the liberal, liberal, liberal all the time to try to find ourselves in the corner then we don't even see grace at all. So my point tonight is, we've got to rightly understand what the law was for, then find out then what did Jesus Christ do. He brought us grace. Now as I say these things tonight, brothers and sisters, I ask you to turn with me. <clears throat> Jeremiah 31. <clears throat> no, we do not deny the fact that it was Moses in the book of the writings of Exodus that he wrote it. So that's in the Torah. He wrote us the commandments in the 19th chapter. And as we come into the book of Leviticus, we see all the other statutes and ordinances that Israel was to keep. The Sabbaths and everything. That was the old covenant. But it was Jeremiah the prophet. In 606 B.C., We're in the 31st chapter, starting in the 31st verse. Behold, the days come. And this was prophesied while the law was still active. The law of Moses was still active when the prophet said these things. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. What's he mean by a new covenant? With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So he's talking about the two categories of the nation. 
Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So now he's pointing backward to Exodus. Which by covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, meaning a period of time. Saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. When he says put it in their inward parts, he's not talking about it with a doorpost to their kitchen or their living room. And write it in their hearts. And will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. And I can just see the Jew. Cause when the Sabbath day come, hey John, you're walking too far. They looked at Jesus, hey, you ain't supposed to be going through the cornfield on the Sabbath day. That was the Jew of that hour. Don't do this, don't do that. And I'm not belittling it. But the sad part of it is, they lost sight of what it was pointing to. Yes, in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And can't you just see, brothers and sisters, the Jew of the hour, when the law was all he had, they watched each other. How far was they going to go from the house? Is he breaking the Sabbath? Brothers and sisters, your life was watched. Because each one was judged by what was written. And you would absolutely have to read every ordinance and statute that goes with that law. So we can see. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. And either will they be watching and spying on one another. You broke this and you broke that. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them. When was that going to be? While the law was still active? No. It's when the new covenant was made. And we've got to find out, brothers and sisters, from the word of God, not from some denominational church, what this covenant was. How is it to be applied to our lives? What did it do that the law could not do? So, brothers and sisters, turn with me then to Romans. The third chapter. Paul, in the first part of the chapter, he's been comparing the Jew and the Gentile in concerning belief and unbelief. So we start in the ninth verse then. Paul is using a comparison. What then? Are we better than they? No. In no wise, for we have before proved both you and Gentile that they are all under sin. What did Paul, a Jew, who at one time had sat on the Sanhedrin court, Testified that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees of touching the law. He was blameless. What's he saying this for? Well, the analysis of the whole thing is the law in itself, no matter how you kept it, did not make you righteous. What it was, it showed you where sin lay at. That's why I could say, be said later, after the grace came along by Jesus Christ. For God hath concluded that all are under sin. Meaning, we're born in this world, it was a natural nature to not seek after God, 
And if there's not something up there to remind us, and that's why I say, brothers and sisters, when our society has taken out our public places and institutions and, and courthouses and things, the Ten Commandments, it was made for the natural man that we all are. God made it to show the sinful man that we all are by nature in our birth. To control us. To discipline us. To show us what God requires and wants of us. And look at America tonight. For they shut them away from the Ten Commandments. And they shut them away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't mention God nor Jesus Christ, his means of salvation. They're like a bunch of devils. There's none of them righteous. Don't touch me. Don't talk to me. Don't talk about religion. You can't even teach morality to them. You can't even talk principles. They don't know how to spell it. So we're going to find out, brothers and sisters, by the time we get done with this, the law was applicable for a certain period of time. And in all of the law, in all of the ordinances, and the statutes that they were to keep, there were set forth types and shadows pointing ahead to something that God was going to do for the human race. And he would do it and send it first to the Jewish nation because they was the nation that had received this. Hoping that they would be a light and reflect this. But then when the new covenant came and the messenger of it came, they stood and looked at him and said, crucify him. Because they didn't know who he was. But yet they could say, we've kept the Sabbath. We believe in circumcision. We don't eat pork. We don't do this and we don't do that. We keep this and we keep that. And turned right around and said, Come, crucify him. Away with him. And he was the messenger of the new covenant. So let's be careful, brothers and sisters. And I say to my Jewish friends, you are my friends. I'm preaching this to let you know. Yes, I'm a Gentile, but I'm not an ignoramus idiot. I know what this precious book, the Word of God, says. I wasn't born yesterday. I've seen a lot of ups and downs and ins and outs and do's and don'ts. I've seen a lot of glory seekers in my lifetime. They don't want to work with nobody. They want all the glory or none. There's a place for that kind. So I leave it up to the individual and to the Lord. So when we see here, when Paul says this, For we have proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Why did he say that? Because the law could not redeem them from the stain of what sin, the nature that we're born with. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. And I have to say, in the advent of Christ. And all of those Jews. That was so Pharisaic. Look at their garments. How they like to portray them. They look so holy. As they walked in the streets of Judaism. But this is another Jew that's talking here. He said there's none that understandeth. What did he mean by that? Man, after you've read it and read it and read it, and you've kept it and kept it and kept it, if God haven't given you a revelation, how to look through the writing. Remember, it was Apostle Paul said, the letter, that's the word that you can read. It killeth. But it's the Spirit of God that takes it and quickens it and makes it alive. You see me law beyond the letter. You see the author and what it requires. There's none that understand us. There's none that seek it after God. And I remind my Jewish listeners not to belittle, not to run down. God help you. But as I read the histories, not only in the New Testament, but to your ancestors of the hour that your Messiah had came, 
They didn't see him. They literally despised him. Unless God had gave them a little inspiration and an insight. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There's none that does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And when Paul said this, he's looking back to the old Judaistic Jew. You carry the hate. And the way of peace have they not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatsoever the law says, it says to them who are under the law. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law, deeds mean the acts, keeping it, observing it, right to the letter. There shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. If the law had never been written and given to mortal man, what man would have ever known? Certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And now, brothers and sisters, I want to use a comparison right here in America tonight. It takes the law, says, thou shalt not kill. But look at our young generation today. Young people carrying guns to school. What for? They got some hate. Somewhere somebody said something to another. They got some animosity. I'll get even. Because there's nothing. And what do you think the law of the land means to them? Nothing. Because it's the law of a man. Because the carnal man of our governments today has taken the laws that was based on the Ten Commandments and they have absolutely rearranged them and gave them another interpretation. That's why the Constitution don't even mean a thing that our forefathers wrote it to be. So I have to say, the next time you hear, and I hate to say, for fear I would be misunderstood, but the next time some hot-headed kid goes into the schoolhouse with a shotgun or a pipe bomb and starts killing people. Come on, you liberal-minded politicians and educators. Don't cry before me because them innocent children are shot when you bred the whole rotten cons thing up yourself. How in the world do you think that you can write a law that has eternal life in it? Who are you to say it's wrong to kill? If it's not wrong to commit adultery. Whenever last one of you are as guilty as hell itself. It's a shame. Then when I can see, I can remember. Sixty years ago. You think, I don't know what I was talking about. Like we come out of a medieval past. I'm, I thank God tonight I came from the hour and saw some things. But I can see how the devil, through the blindness of men's eyes, cutting them off from God, has clouded their minds with spider webs of deceit. As long as we think we have the knowledge of the stars and the moons, and the asteroids. One of these days, just a little bit of the old crumb of one of them will hit you between the eyes and take you into oblivion. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? <clears throat> but I have to say, above all of this, there's a God out there. And he holds this whole thing together. That's why Paul could write. For the invisible things of God are clearly seen and understood, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Well, I have to say tonight, brothers and sisters, 
The law was good for what it was intended for. Because it kept the natural man we are from going berserk. This is what gets Gentiles and Gentile Christians to say. When you say, well, we ought to restore the death penalty for these criminals or these hardened criminals. Oh, but the Bible says thou shalt not kill. Why do you want to hide behind that for? You don't want to use the Bible for anything else? <clears throat> but it was the law that said, Thou shalt not commit to murder. Which means, you don't pick up a gun and go out here and shoot somebody's head for selfish interest. Selfish aim or gain. But when it comes to the cause of a nation, and certain principles of the right of that nation in its identity, and that is troubled, that's attacked, then that nation has a right to call to muster to arms to go out to defend that nation, this society, and such like. <clears throat> the, sad, the sad part of it is people have been taught and misconstrued about a lot of things. God don't lie. God don't deceive people. It's man through the influence of Satan many times that does these rotten things. Because he don't even have the knowledge of what he's reading. The same law that said, thou shalt not commit murder. And told Joshua, when you go in to attack Jericho, don't you leave a one of them. Amen. Now that's a different thing. <clears throat> go with me to Romans, the seventh chapter. I think we're in this chapter where Brother Allen was at last Thursday night, and little did I realize. That I was going to be getting in any of it tonight <clears throat> at the time he preached this. Now you read from verses 1 down to verses 11, and you'll see what Paul talked about. It took the law in its natural to point to the natural man that I am. I was born a natural man. Sooner or later, these natural instincts and these lusts and these affections. If they're not somehow or other brought under control, do something. I mean, I would explode. Go all to pieces. Go out here and tear up something other. Hate somebody. So then, here's what he says. For the law is holy, sure. And the commandment holy. And just and good. It was. Because it came from a holy God. Was then that which is good made desolate to me? God forbid. But it showed us what sin was. The law wasn't sin. But the law, the way it was written, brothers and sisters, it showed exactly the nature that I am. That sin, that it might appear sin. In other words, it brings the real nature of sin out of us. And that in itself worketh death in me, by that which is good. That sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So under the law, yes, keep it. Bring your sacrifices. Because brother and sister, you had to bring something for sin every year. And that offering, brothers and sisters, did not atone for ever. No, it only pushed your sins ahead. Ahead. And as it pushes our, our sins ahead, then God justified it. Because the law demanded that. And if we could keep obedient to that natural aspect of it. Yes, God considers us righteous in that respect. But not because we have a righteous spirit. Because deep inside, as Paul would say, that which I'd like to do, I find myself doing the opposite. Amen. 
Yeah, for that which I do, here we come. I'll how not. Actually said, what I would like to do, many times I find myself doing the opposite. For what I would do, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. Sooner or later, the old flesh gives in to sin, the nature of it. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. In other words, there it hangs. Over the doorpost, every time you go in and out, it says, thou shalt not. But deep inside of me, there's something that just gnaws away at my old nature. And John's are watching me, and Jim's are watching me, and I'm watching them. To see which one did the worst. And we all got a category in our mind. He did this and he did that. He did worse than I did. And it sounds like a lot of loose living Christians today, brothers and sisters. I then do that which I would not. I consent unto the law that it's good. Because it reminds me what God really wants me to be like. Now then it is no more I that do it. But sin that dwelleth in me. In other words, it's that nature. Sooner or later that gets me in a trap. When I don't want to. But all oh, that old flesh. It can just take so much of this, we will say, being submissive to the law. And you know we've got a bunch of backslidden rascals in our governments and education systems that they say, a lot of this Christian, it's just people are oppressed. Don't do this and don't do that. Well, I have to say, thank God tonight. I'm not oppressed. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You hypocrites, don't even take a look at me. I do it because I love to do it. I have lived this way, brothers and sisters, by the grace of God, because I love the Lord. I love His truth. I don't want to do anything else. Go ahead and yell and snort and cough and spit. If what I'm doing is pleasing the Lord, then that's all I ask. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now see, that's what Paul is talking about. The law was given because it made man to see his own sinful self. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, that's true, dwelleth no good thing. For to will or for to want to is present with me. I'd like to. I hope to. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. Now let's take the natural man. Here was a young boy growing up. Daddy says, son, don't ever smoke. Well, that sounds good to the young boy. But then finally he's 13. Finally he's 14. He going to school. And here's some other kids in there. Did you ever smoke? No. Why? Well, dad don't want me to. Ah. Oh. Your dad this and your dad that. So it was like when I was in the school, brothers and sisters, recess, we went out behind the men's, the boys' toilet. And of course, brother, they, they didn't, back then, they didn't have the money to buy a ready-made. They carried a little sack of tobacco and some cigarette paper. And so right quickly, they poured it out and light it. They pass it around among themselves. Well, a little taste now, and a little taste a little bit later on. And deep in your mind, Dad said, son, don't ever smoke. Well, that's Dad's word. But Dad's saying it for a purpose because he knows. But all these friends, they're motivated by a nature that they are. And that's the nature I've got in me. And I try to hold on to what Dad said, but after a while, I'm puffing away too. And it's that same way, brothers and sisters, by a little taste of beer. Or a little taste of whiskey. Oh, come on, it won't hurt you. And I'm thankful I can say this tonight and not lie. In my young life, brothers and sisters, I have watched and seen what men 
Many times they were neighbors. What they did and how they were acting when they got drunk. And I said, thank God when I grow up, Lord, help me to never get like that. But brother, when they shipped me overseas, they put me in that old outfit. And some of them men were already 40. Been in the army for years. They drank beer, they got drunk, they gambled, they smoked. They did the whole nine yards. So it wasn't long, brothers and sisters. Here I am, just a young rookie right from the States. It isn't long, brothers and sisters, they're saying. Oh, come on, have a beer. I said, no. Why? Well, I just don't want to drink. Oh, you come on. You're just like the rest of us. I said, no, I'm not. I said, you won't be long. There was others that had been put in the outfit about five months before us. Yep, they were just as big a drunkards as the old ones was. But I look back on that era and I have to say, thank you, Lord. You know why? Yes, one time, one of them said, oh, come on, take a little swallow. I did. They said, what does it taste like? I said, mom's dishwater. <laughs> and I bet it. So every time they would get together, they'd get two or three cans of beer. Oh, come on, bro. Mr. Jackson, take a swallow. Well, I did. What does it taste like? Mom's dishwater. Well, they got tired of hearing that. After a while, they got tired of offering it to me. And I have to say, thank the Lord. I heard that voice. I heard that temptation. I heard that compelling outlook, that criticism. And I have to say, thank you, Lord. You never did let me get submitted to that stinking stuff. And I watched them brothers and sisters every time payday came. They didn't anymore get back to their bunks. They had the cards out or the dice out. They was gambling. And brothers and sisters, in one 24 hours, they just, some of them have just about lost all their little meager 30-some dollars payment. Well, you know what? It wasn't long when some would get paid. They'd come to me and hand me $3. Would you keep that until the next payday? Well, I had compartments, brothers and sisters, in my pocketbook. I was a walking bank for them guys. Some would give me $5, depending on what their rank was, what they drawed. So I looked back, brothers and sisters, after a while, them guys began to trust me. They knew that I wouldn't drink, and they knew that I didn't lie. They knew that I wasn't going to steal. And so when they would lose all their money, then that's when they needed something other to buy some more beer and some cigarettes and stuff. They came, Raymond, you still got it? I said, sure, I got it. So I have to look back, brothers and sisters, even though, brothers and sisters, I had just as much nature inside of me. I could have been just one of them. It was the grace of God, not because of the law. It was the grace of God that kept me from becoming wrapped up and twisted up in that old sinful way of life. And I say these things tonight. In the natural mind, yes, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But sometimes it's grace that comes down and gives you the will to override what compelling voice is trying to force on you and force into you. So I have to say, there's a lot, brothers and sisters, that God many times sovereignly, He does for us. And I'm thankful to the Lord that tonight for that. So, I think with this, as an introduction, I'm going to just say, we'll pick this up Sunday. I'm praying that God will give me the right words to say to help the Jewish people. Because I got a message, brothers and sisters, that shows them exactly what did the Sabbath stand for, what did it mean, and I want them to know. Yes, many times they've been told over there, we Americans, we Americans, we Americans. I grant you, yes, the American modern society of today have become so loose living. But I ask my Jewish friends over there, don't forget, there's 5.2 million of your fellow men, Jews in New York and across America. They wouldn't come back to Israel because they like this lifestyle over here. And they're just as bad as any of us Gentiles. There's a few here and there that's got somehow or other some deep mode. 
And I hope one day that something does shake their being and causes them to begin to realize the land of Israel is their homeland. They just don't want to be able to have rocks thrown at them. They want to escape all the ridicule, but while the ones that are over there are having to risk their lives, their infants, their little children, the ridicule of the Palestinians. And so I say to my Jewish friends, I realize I'm a Gentile, but don't never think that I'm ignorant of what the Torah said, nor what the law said. But if you listen me through, no, I'll not condemn the law. The law is still for the natural man. When you take the natural law away from the natural man that we all were, you took the very thing away that could convict him and show him it's wrong to do this, it's wrong to do that. But if you're going to be righteous, then there's another covenant that God will come down and put in your life. You don't have to have it hanging over your doorpost. He puts it in your heart. And that's why you say, I don't do that because I love the Lord. I want to live a life that's so pleasing to Him. That no matter what the test is or the temptation or the environment, it's by His grace I am what I am. And I just pray, Lord, help us to exemplify this grace and show it and live it because we don't have another lifetime. We don't have 25 years left. This thing's going to wrap up one of these days so fast it's going to spin some people completely out of their thinking. But I'm thankful to God tonight for a precious book. There was an old covenant, but there's a new one. And the new one isn't an extension of the old one. It's a fulfillment of the old one. Heavenly Father, take these words tonight. And Lord, help me to say it in a wise way, in a humble way. Because I realize, Lord, many of those people have come back from other places. They've come back knowing, Lord, that you're bringing them back into the land. To plant them there, to get them ready, Lord, for the last day visitation. And whatever, God, you have planned. So, Lord... You just touch their hearts. You help them to understand what I'm, what I'm saying. Give them the right meaning. And Lord, as a people of Gentiles who believe in your grace and mercy, we thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord with all my heart. So just... Pray for me that I'll be able to say the right things in the right way. For me, very carefully, watching over me, night.
Calvary and your riches untold. 